day, good day, listeners and viewers of the Real Stuff Podcast. Today, we have Indigenous Outlook, and our guest this morning is Dr. Marcus Goff, attorney at law, and he's going to take us through this topic, land and the community or people's rights in Jamaica. I mean, everybody's confused as to the rights the people have. Land, land is so critical, and over time, land has been probably the biggest thing in any country, really, and especially for indigenous people. We also have this morning with us my co-host, Miss Lee, out of the beautiful parish of Portland. So, Dr. Goff. Could you just tell our viewers a little about who you are and why you can speak on this topic? Sure. Well, good afternoon um, to you and to your listeners. And to again, my co-panelist, Miss Lee, from Moortown. Um, so I am Marcus Goff, as you were just told. I'm a, an attorney at law. And um, this issue of land rights is an issue that I've been looking at and, and, and you know trying to help communities to find solutions to for some time now, you know. Um, primarily because of course being a history of being a, a student of history, you know, we are, we know that the history of the land rights in Jamaica has been fraught with injustice, right? We know that in the aftermath of um, the emancipation of Africans who were enslaved here in Jamaica, right? There was a period of, of apprenticeship, right? And then full freedom, uh, 1838. And we know that thereafter, there was never any land redistribution. You know, we know that the former enslavers, slave masters got compensation, got reparations. And we know that the enslaved got absolutely nothing, but the criminal law uh, dropped on them, you know? Um, and <clears throat> essentially rendered second-class citizens in the land that they had toiled and sweat and um, you know bled and died for you know for many generations so the issue of the lack of access to land by the average Jamaican is a real issue which has been um, existing for centuries has gone you know unresolved untackled uh, because of you know a kind of continuity in the colonial system of land tenure in Jamaica, you know. So through my work with uh, primarily over the last 15 or so years, the, the Maroon communities, you know, primarily Charlestown and the former Colonel Frank Lums then, um, this issue of then land rights, particularly of then persons and communities like Maroons who have been there before the invading colonizers came, is an issue that really attracted my attention, you know, um, and through the ongoing work of the Charleston Maroon Council and the conference, the Charleston Maroon Annual Conference, uh, which has been going on now for many, many years, then this issue is one that we have high on the agenda, you know, for the Maroon communities, how to resolve these long-standing issues, you know. So we, we, we continue to have uh, clashes between Maroon communities uh, you know, and Maroon Colonels and the state of Jamaica, the government of Jamaica, the police force, etc. Right? There's a famous case that was tried in the Supreme Court of Jamaica where a Maroon Secretary of State, um, Meredy, not Meredy Rowe, uh, Man O. Rowe was charged and convicted of possession of ganja in what was a compound territorial property, you know. And that's one of those cases, that, again, which I think it just continues to highlight, let's say, the ongoing, you know, lack of respect for African land tenure systems, lack of respect for indigenous land tenure systems, and the forcible imposition, you know, of uh, European land tenure systems here in Jamaica, which have operated, let's say, to dispossess the majority of Jamaicans, which has always been the agenda of the white minority, right? Uh, and so that is the continuing reality, unfortunately, in Jamaica, that we continue to see playing out on our TV screens and across the media in 2022, unfortunately. You know, so I'm really, um, you know, very 
committed to trying to find some solution to these problems. You know, without the integrity of land, we destroy our cultural, our indigenous, our traditional communities, right? Without the attachment to land, we destroy the continuity of family, you know? And of course, we continue to uh, maintain peoples and family and communities in poverty, you know? So really, we have to grapple with this land issue in Jamaica. We have to see it as a part of reparations, right? not, not, not a handout or a give out or a privilege or a blight, you know, but as a part of legal justice that is required to give due reparations to those African and African descendants, you know, who, as I say, have not had land justice in Jamaica after all these centuries. But I just speak about mm, the white minority. The, the white minority should have left more or less at independence when we, you know, when, quotes unquote, when we were made independent. But that didn't change anything to date. Right, right. As we know, there are many absentee planters from that time till now, you know. Many of them might have left, but their lands were still here owned by families or maybe they were sold off to other, um, you know, wealthy uh, landed individuals, you know. And of course, we have a lot of lands that are still here as crown lands, you know, that, you know, King Charles has more land here in Jamaica than we do as Jamaicans, you know. <laughs> and that is something that, again, we can't continue to accept, you know what I mean? Uh, it makes absolutely no legal or moral sense for us to have that pit of affairs in 2022, you know, so these are, the, these are the kind of things that we have not properly interrogated since independence, you know what I mean, as to what are the rights of those people, right, who were enslaved for centuries, who were emancipated without reparations, what are their rights, you know, and so we have continued along this colonial project, um, you know, ascribing to some colonial ideals and some colonial concepts of justice, you know, that are, as I say, Eurocentric and at its core are really racially motivated to keep the majority in Jamaica down. But the big question is, do you see a solution or do you see an end to what is happening now? Well, I think the solution must be through Parliament, must be through the laws of the country and it must be through a, a rising up of the voices that are demanding this, you know. And again, it's something that we hear about all the time and you hear, you know, different administrations want to deal with the land issue and deal with the squatter problem as they call it you know and this kind of thing but we don't really see much action you know people tend to talk about michael manley's land lease program you know which was a you know effort in the right direction but it didn't go far enough um, in my opinion you know and what and continued since mm -hmm. right right it was discontinued and it, it, it didn't as i say give the ownership of these lands to the black majority, it really gave some long-term leases, you know, which is not the same as ownership, you know. And so I'm saying that we have to be able to give ownership of lands to the majority, uh, and that is still something that's still to be achieved. What would you say about the the current situation where a lot of land problems has started to pop up all around Jamaica, and in most cases? It had to do with the government. Right. So I'm saying these are long standing issues, you know, long standing issues, as I say. And oftentimes you find that people are then exploited, you know. So people want land, they see idle land, somebody sees the idle land as well and decides to try to sell it off to people who want land. And then you have people who are then needy being exploited, you know what I mean? Um, and that's a, a big problem too, right? We have um, a program called LAMP. Or they change the name now to land, but essentially to facilitate through government um, some access to land titles for people who have been on land a long time and can't get titles. You know? So that we have, again, certain of these um, you know, programs in place that are trying to, I think, you know, bring some greater justice to the people, but it starts off with the fundamental laws, land laws that, again, we have, which are all, I say, premised on some, you know, centuries old white concept of land grounded in English Europe, you know, 
And so, uh, you know, we, we have to be able to review that fundamentally, I'm thinking, you know what I mean? Um, because as I say, these things are based on having a hierarchy of land ownership, right? It's based on prioritizing those who have land title over those who have been there for centuries, you know? Um, and so the law is then and has been a tool for dispossession of people for too long, you know? And so we must start off with readdressing the laws um, making the laws more fit for purpose to serve the interests and the rights of the majority, right? And overthrowing, as it were, legally, some of these uh, archaic, let us say, Eurocentric ideals. Do you think where we are stuck, where we are now, has anything or a lot to do with us still being a crown colony, basically? <laughs> Well, so we, so we aren't a crown colony, but we certainly are still part of the British yeah. realm, right? <laughs> we still um, are under King Charles' jurisdiction, right? Um, and so one would have to ask ourselves, well, why at this stage, you know, are we still tied, you know, um, umbilically, right, in, in a legal way to, to the sovereign of England, you know what I mean? Um, and I think that's, it's a part of the problem for sure, right? This, this holding on, this feeling of some grandeur or, or being a part of some commonwealth family, this kind of thing. That's, again, just, you know, from my own perspective, neo-colonial um, mental, you know, sort of gimmicks, essentially, you know, to make you feel as if you are part of some commonwealth of independent nations that, you know, we are all equal and that um, let bygones be bygones, that kind of thing. And I'm saying that absolutely not. You know, if there has been <laughs> such a substantial infringement of people's rights of Africans for centuries, like what we call slavery and the slave trade, then there's no way we can move on by brushing the, on the, the carpet. We can't forget that. And our ancestors will never allow us to forget their experiences, their sacrifices, their suffering, you know. And so we too here cannot do that, you know. Um, and so I'm saying we have to continue to strike, uh, to seek reparations for all of what has been done unfairly to our ancestors, and land rights is a fundamental part of that. Mm -hmm. Speaking about that and speaking about all the past and the indigenous people, with this new flare-up, if you could call it that, of all these interruptions or stuff with land, all over Jamaica, do you think that the indigenous people's rights with, for land will, is, is under threat? Definitely, definitely. I mean, I, I want to say that we just saw recently released by the government of Jamaica a report uh, to the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination where they are saying that there are no indigenous peoples in Jamaica, you know? And so by the very fact of that non-recognition um, means that they're definitely not going to be recognizing any land rights of any indigenous peoples here in Jamaica soon, you know? So the of government course, actually put that out? It's actually in black and white, filed on the UN um, website. And that this is what they're saying in 2022, right? In 2022, they're saying that the Spanish came and exterminated all of the indigenous peoples and still kind of, you know, perpetrating that kind of, um, I don't know what to call it, other than, I don't know, hogwash, you know, or some sort, but even that is not so kind <laughs> to the hogs, right? But um, that kind of, a, you know, perpetuation of this myth that has been well and long, you know, made defunct, you know, it's, that again just shows that, you know, we are quite content to call ourselves, you know, the bastion of the, um, you know, the, the, the African diaspora in the Caribbean. But at the same time, we're holding on dearly to some of these colonial relics and ideas yeah. and principles and, and lies and using them to our advantage when it suits us. At the same time, claiming to be, you know, identifying with, you know, black power and Afrocentricity and Pan-Africanism and Garvey and Rastafari. And I'm saying the reality is that there's a big gap, there's a big gulf between those two because we are not recognizing that a lot of the sources of our continuation 
of um, marginalization stems from these very same colonial ideals and principles and precepts and lies and myths that we continue to perpetuate in modern century uh, Jamaica. But the only difference is that the people who are carrying this true now are black people. Right. And again, look like me and you. you know, hmm? It's amazing. Well, you know, again, you know, black people in this part of the world, actually around the world everywhere, have been traumatized immensely. You know, we've suffered a lot of discrimination, intergenerational discrimination, right? Wherever black people are in the world, we are looked down upon and treated as certain class citizens. And so, you know, that has caused then many people to have an inferiority complex, you know? And mm -hmm. so you want to be recognized by the crown and by the king of this and the queen of that by Europe here and there, you know what I mean, to feel a sense of accomplishment and recognition and maybe to feel a sense of, um, you know, upliftment over and above your neighbor too, right? All a part of what has been the colonial experiment since the days of slavery. And so people want to, you know, like the, the prime minister we hear, you know, last year it was, went up and applied to get some people councillor recognition from the queen. You know what I mean? But at the same time, talking to the next side of his mouth to say he wants to move away from the monarchy, you know? Because again, it's a kind of schizophrenia that we have because, again, we are a traumatized people trying to forge our way to independence and emancipation mentally, but at the same time, feeling pride in holding on to some of our colonial legacies. Mm. It looks like it's a very long road. Well, ahead of us, road. it's been a long road. Yeah, but I mean, I ahead of us, road. coming, still coming. Yeah, still coming, still coming. I mean, and I say it again, it starts with let's get rid of the monarchy. What are we holding on to? The same people, the same red coats who were running on us in 1655, right? We're yeah. still holding on to freedom government. Why? I don't understand why. You know, we're still holding on to these honors and these titles and and and, and these things that are being handed down by people who look down on us. If you look at how the royal family has treated with, with Prince Harry and Meghan and their African child, right? Then we see clearly that we're not a part of any Commonwealth family or any royal family, any British family, right? We're looking out for our own African families at this point in time. And so again, we have taken too long to separate ourselves and to truly start to emancipate and decolonize ourselves fully. But to my mind, we're not looking in the right in the right direction, because I think what the British did to us in '62, they left something that we did we haven't even realized that they left it for us, and they left it for us. And I I think if we don't get rid of that, we have no chance to change, and that's the Westminster system. It keep us right. in that situation so where we can't do anything for ourselves. Again, no matter how we try. Yeah, we, sh we should have interrogated the entire um, inheritance that we got. Yeah, right? We should have we reviewed it, scrutinized it, and fling out what is not fit for purpose and keep what you want to keep which you think can help you as a people. Yeah. So we kept it all on sundry, the two party system and all. Right? It's not really helping us. And here we are still trying to work the white man system. But we need, we need to, we need to. That is the first thing I think we need to change. Because all our laws are British laws, basically. And everything, you know, leads back to back in those days. Right. So, I mean, again, as a lawyer, I would say that, you know, the common law isn't all bad. You know, the common law where we have the judges being able to use their intellect and their yeah. sense of justice to come to certain reason reason conclusion it's, it's not bad it's not all bad you know what i mean yeah at least it allows for a living interpretation of the law as we go along but we have on our statute book some 18th century 19th century law that we're still working with today you know and so 18th century uh, structures of governance that we're still using today which we've never ever sought to interrogate and question and improve and strengthen you know, yeah. that's where I'm saying that we have, we, we, we're still at the baby stages of a post-colonial society because we have not yet gone through all these issues of what a truly sovereign nation would do to assess again 
what is it that I have to govern, what do I have to use as my tools, what do I want to accomplish, what is best, how is it best for me to do that based on my history, my reality, and of course, our well, combined future. But instead, as I said, we just use what we had of all along, not properly try to see where the weaknesses are, right? I mean, those laws are full of discrimination, right? Bias, prejudice, all of these things are built into the law because, of course, they're written by people who were, again, seeing themselves as superior to the majority black population here, right? And so if you're still going to be using those laws and trying to arrive at a just crime-free society with those laws, you're joking. Mm. It's amazing. It's amazing where we are at now and where we should be. After 60, 60 years of independence, and it's like we are on the first day of independence, we have moved one inch in the direction that we need to go. And the land is a major, major part of it where people are, you know, are just not comfortable. And Very some cool. people, I think, just just give up and say, that's their lot in life. That's how, you know, that's how it is. That's how it's going to be. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. So what's your view on a part that we can take to incrementally getting rid of all these things we're talking about well you know i've been you know observing the new ministry that was created last year right ministry of constitutional and legal affairs i think it's called right yeah so i'm here thinking that you know if it is that that ministry is going to be you know focused on reviewing all of our laws from a to z and to eradicate you know the, the the vestiges of slavery and colonialism from those laws and to retrofit them in a modern human rights based framework and all of that you know to strengthen our constitutional integrity and all of that then i'm saying that's something that is useful but if it's that, that you're doing then i'm saying again i'm not sure what, what i heard from that minister minister malahu for it mm. recently is that she's working on removing the monarchy as you know the head of state which is very very as, as we say important right but apart from that apart from that there are a whole lot of other uh, legal work to be done you know to as i say properly interrogate and to properly upgrade you know and modernize and and to and to emancipate as i say our legal system from uh, english slavery and so that's an ongoing work to be done which i'm not sure we are properly focusing on that bigger mission I don't know. I, I, I think if we m remove the king as head and all that without changing the Westminster system, not much will be changed. Definitely not. Definitely not. I mean, if it's only going to be to take out the king and put in um, a president alone, that's the only change that, yeah. that we're making. And yes, we're not, we're not really serious about systemic reform. You know what I mean? No. So. I say it's very important, yes, but it can't be the be all and the end all. I like say finally we've done it and we've completed the circle of independence that you're always talking about. No, sir, it's a whole heap of work to complete mm. that circle of independence. Uh, and removing the queen or the king is just starting off that process, you know. So I hope that we see it in that way and not just that is the end of it, but it's starting what needs to be done overall to kind of improve where we are, you know. I think the aim must be for Jamaicans to live comfortable. Because right now, the majority of Jamaicans are totally uncomfortable, especially when it comes to land and then the children and all that. I well, think it's... Something. Vision 2030, right? Vision 2030 says the place to... <laughs> Go again. <laughs> to live and whatever, whatever. But I read, no. I read it, I got a, whole, a full copy of it and I read it and... I was totally disappointed. Okay, well, totally you know, disappointed. 
Yes, yes. Um, live, work, raise families and do business. Yes, yes. You know what I mean? Yes. yes. And so I'm saying that, um, you know, to do that, yeah, it's, it's a whole lot of work. And I mean, it, it's a useful slogan and target. Oh, yes, it is, that, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, again, you see the two-party system, it only allows persons in government to have a kind of three-year to me, plan because for three years, they say, All right, we're gonna try and do something in those three years, but for the remaining two years, or a year and a half, or one year, they'll focus on getting back into that seat by winning your elections. And so, we don't have the space in our system to be able to plan short term, medium term, long term because all the planning is all about what to do to get the votes to win back get back in power and it all goes over and over and over again you know what i mean we are in a, some other countries they they have a 10 year 20 year 30 year plan that they can really work toward because no matter who's in power the plan is still being you know processed and yeah is going toward its objective but here again from start by one party they don't like it it clean out and the same thing might come back again with more money different name and I'm saying you can't move forward that way. Two step forward, one step back, or one step forward and two step back. You yeah. know what I mean? And that's why we hear still, right? We've got a lot of countries, like even as well as here about Singapore, has been, of course, similar to us, a very small nation, former uh, British, how they have been able to use their resources to maximize their economic strength globally. You know what I mean? And Jamaica is a recognized powerhouse in music and culture, art, sports. Um, what else? In ganja, in food, mm, yeah. food yeah. in Parisian, you know, in so many things, right? But again, if you keep on viewing development, viewing, um, you know, progress through the lens of a, a, a Eurocentric perspective, you'll never be able to capitalize on what are homegrown talents, homegrown resources that we have here. You know what I mean? And so again, we're always pursuing this kind of path to development that like is not a path that like is created by or developed by us or by people of African descent, but it's one that is a path set out for us by the developed nations of the world that we are said to, you know, be able to or want to follow. And of course, we don't end up where we want to in that kind of path. And so again, we have to be thinking outside of the box we have been given. I see some boxes here on the screen here. The lady, right? I think outside of the box. Let me go outside yeah. the box here if I can, right? Yes, yes. Outside of the box, because when you stay in the box, your mind is limited. Your mind is 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 hampered by this box. If you think, well, I can't go, I can't think this, I can't, I have to only work within what I'm given. That is why we're still where we are in this day and time. Yeah? Yep. But realistically, how do we change it? Well, I'm saying advocacy. Advocacy is where it starts. I think that people talk about these things, right? And of course, using the law where we can as well too, right? Uh, for those who can, to make sure you challenge where you see that people's rights are, are, are not being respected. And also, I'm saying we have to be pressuring our politicians, our parliamentarians who have the authority to be able to change and pass and make law in parliament to make some laws that can correct some of these centuries old wrongdoings you know what i mean and so i think it's on those levels you have to be vocal about it you have to be adamant about it you have to talk to those of the power to change it and you have to be consistent and persistent in that um, process you know when the politicians want to create a new constituency or they want to build up something that they have power over one border put some people here and some people there they find ways and means to do that right to serve their political objectives and so yeah. I'm saying, Similarly, right, we, if we have the real intention, if we hold the persons in government accountable, then we should be able to equally ask them, right, to find a solution to this land problem or else to put in power someone else who will do so. Yes. Can you speak a little about the, the Bob Marley Beach, how that came about and what is it all about really? So Bob Marley Beach um, is a is a you know world famous beach from from a long time. It was only named Bob Marley Beach in about the nineteen eighties, shortly after Bob Marley died. But it's been a beach that's been used by the Rastafari community for many many exactly decades. exactly where it is. 
it's on the border of St. Andrew and St. Thomas by Bull Bay. Okay. By Bull Bay, yes. Is that seven miles, nine miles? Nine miles. Nine, nine miles. miles. Bull Bay. Yes, as you pass the, the if, if you come from Kingston side, as you pass the Bull Bay Police Station, mm -hmm. uh, it's about one minute drive past that. On the right hand side, there's a turn off the main road. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know where it is now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, into, into the Bob Marley Beach area. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yes, that, that beach has been there for a long time. Used by the Rastafari community for many, many decades. Uh, it's the site of the first Nyabingi tabernacle that was built there in about the 1950s. And it was a space where the community would come and chant and, you know, gather for certain times around the year um, to basically, you know, celebrate and, and, and hold... Um, you know, spiritual um, session, uh, as we call it, Nabingi, mm -hmm. in those locations. So uh, we were informed now recently that there's a new landowner who has bought up all of the, or most of the surrounding lands in that area. About over 300 acres they have bought up uh, in that area. A company called Woof Group Limited. Um, oh, no. Woof, W-O-O-F, Woof. Okay. Woof Group Limited, yes, W O O F. Okay. And uh, they have essentially been telling people that they have to leave the beach because the, the new owners want it, right? As a part of their land rights and their hotel development. Mm -hmm. Here is a multi billion dollar um, hotel being built, built up there. It's going to be part of the world famous Marriott Hotel line. Okay. You know, or chain of hotels. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the families there, as I said, don't have any objection per se to the hotel, but then, you know, they have been there for, I'll say, 50, 60 or more years. And so, you know, they were, of course, very, very concerned when they were receiving threats and messages from, you know, various persons on the ground, including the police, that they have to leave by X date or their homes will be bulldozed down flat, you know? And so because of that, we really created a whole campaign to kind of help to bring more attention to this issue um, and to also seek to secure the land rights of those families who have been there for decades. Um, and so that's what was in the courts recently. We were able to get an injunction, which is a, a staff order from the court to prevent any demolition of any buildings uh, that are there. Um, uh, and we also have filed in court uh, since last week a application for prescription rights, prescri prescriptive rights for, for the public, basically to allow the public to continue to use that beach as a public beach uh, in the future without, you know, anyone being able to privatize or to block the public access to that beach, you know. So something, something similar to what we actually were able to accomplish with Winifred Beach in Portland, some Port, time yeah. ago too. Yes, so we're trying to have the same thing done for Bob Marley Beach as well too. You know, so the public, those of you that beach for many, many decades, you know, um, can continue to do so, right, and not have it turn into a private, exclusive tourist getaway. But tourism or not, why are we restricting almost all our beaches in Jamaica? To foreign use only yeah again you know it's like this this business model that was built up some time ago in jamaica right which um they call the all-inclusive inclusive. Right? oh yes right where they say all right you can come to jamaica and feel all right and nobody's gonna trouble you and, you know there's this big campaign in the 80s about don't harass the tourists right yeah this i remember big, it yeah i remember yeah this big that well you know locals and tourists can not mix because mm -hmm. locals are harassed with tourists or, the tourists them don't want no locals and when the tourists them come they want to see white sun and white faces at their private beach and that is what we have been selling to the tourists for all these decades you know so the hoteliers say all right we don't want no black face we don't want no locals on the beach no trouble with nice nice foreigners them right and we have this divide again on the beach i've seen some of these hotels they build the fence from the land come right down into the water yeah sometimes yeah. Mm -hmm. you know um and you must stay there and we stay here so it's like a kind of a racial apartheid 
and our island beaches. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, and so, again, why have we accepted that this is the only way to have a tourist industry? You know what I mean? Why do we have to then spread ourselves so wide, right, and open, right? Whereby it's either you take everything that you come and see here or nothing. Why can't we have a beach to be shared by tourists and locals? What, what, what is the sin or the danger or the detriment in having locals and tourists share a, a beach space? You know what I mean? It's really, again, just because we have, over time, accepted these kinds of, and I say, what I would say, again, is a, is a Eurocentric perspective of development, that whatever the white man wants, whatever the tourists want, you know what I mean? And that, that should not have any obligation to respect the rights of our locals. You know what I mean? And so I'm saying, again, it's based on the premise that some people and their rights are more important than other people and other people's rights. You know what I mean? And I'm saying that it's all coming back again from the slavery and the colonization and the white and the mulatto and the mestizo and the this and the come down to the black people in a hierarchical structure where we know where our black families them are in that structure. And I'm saying, how long, how much longer do we have to continue to accept these types of, you know, broadcast in your face, uh, inferiority, right? Measures that are still in place here. Why and for how long? How many more of our children and grandchildren and great great grandchildren are going to have to grow up feeling that they can't go to that beach unless they go and stay at the hotel? Yeah. And, you know that kind of thing you know how much more do we have to go through um having i said sacrifice so many of us our families our ancestors for decades and centuries sacrifice to be here right and i can't even go to enjoy a beach no more because the best beaches are gone to some private hotel interests yeah you know ongoing so ongoing um legacies of slavery of colonization, of injustice, you know, dispossession, marginalization, you know what I mean, that we continue to have to endure. You know, but we have, come, we have countries that were in our same situation, who all their beaches are private, are pro public. Exactly, exactly. And I, I don't hear about no whole of mass murder, mass murder of tourists. No, or... so it's a matter of our people, you know, our people, our leaders. It's a mindset. It's, yeah. it's a mindset. It's a mindset that says that essentially nothing too local, no good, as it were, <laughs> for the tourists to experience. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. yeah. And so you, you, you go to some of these hotels now, a little spot is there for the lady who is in her bandana clothing and she's selling some art and crafting, which is good. I mean, at least they try to. But well, again, I'm saying that it shouldn't Tokenism. be that way. Tokenism. Exactly. It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't yeah. be that way. You have a, a one and two wheel hand pick and they're just there. And it, it, it's the same thing. Like even when you go to Ultrius and you come off of the cruise pier, right? Yeah. They, they, they carry to Island Village and they do not carry to Fisherman Beach. They oh, not yes, carry yes, to yes, yes, yes. Craft yeah. Center, you know? So I'm saying the whole thing is built into keeping the tourist product only to benefit certain types of tourist interests. Yeah. You know what I mean? And again, to cut off the foreign exchange from the locals who also should have a right to earn from tourism too. You know? Mm -hmm. I, know I know quite a few craft people who just get out of the business because of the same thing. It's yeah, hard to survive. When they open up, Falmouth, right? They said, oh, Falmouth is going to be the place where the locals will be able to interact with the tourists. Don't worry about it. They're going to redevelop that whole town, a heritage site. They're going to be able, and, and as it always goes, when it opens up, the local people are cut off, far away, removed yeah. from the tourist ship, from the cruise ship. And only certain players, certain stores, and certain shops who are primarily, again, on the north coast owned by what i would say are not long time jamaican yeah right <laughs> they're the ones who are eating the food of the tourists mm, i like how you put it 
like I forgot to is some fake Jamaican products too. Some fake little Rasta yeah. thing where them find out a South America or something and go bring it and I sell as an authentic Jamaican product. China, the China, whole thing, China. Made in China. The whole thing is exploitative. <laughs> yeah, I tell you. You know mm. what I mean? And again, designed to kill our local industry where people say not not going for anyway. So I'm saying it's just it's just it's just circles and circles of you know a carbon barrel type of thing and who can rise at the top if I st step on your or my head or face or nose to get there what are we gonna do and the small man the local right the less than privileged get the brunt of the stick as always yeah. so they are con you know they are keeping us in poverty totally because if we you know, what we do well and we can't do it to make money so we can live they rather yeah. import stuff so we're putting out a foreign exchange and the people in jamaica no benefit at all so if you even look on now look on ganja right now right look on ganja right now so the whole world is saying oh ganja is a great medicine right we need more ganja in our lives people are talking about now we need more cbd oil we need to have ganja being sold as you know therapeutics and all of this right and i'm saying again now that when the tourists come to jamaica right how much how many of them are able to you know freely go and visit a rastafari ganja space no is the this one who have a silly license that's so like there's so there's so no other interaction again for the grassroots who is is the rest of the far and the grassroots of jamaica create this jamaica ganja brand of for course the tourists when they come and here they don't have going. a chance mm. we don't oh, we don't mark this to the tourists we don't tell them so listen you can go to that the rest of one space and that space and they, no we say you go to this uh, big shop at a big shop and so again i'm saying that the local product the local people are seen as being not fit enough not of the standard enough or not entitled to make the money enough from the foreigners who come here and so it's all about i'm saying just taking away what has been the grassroots people them idea and culture you know how much grassroots man and rastafari get locked up and sent to prison for decades for a small little spiff of ganja oh yes oh yes and now that the world is saying we want to experience the ganja why is it that we're getting, we have so many big man foreign com companies com here control it mm. exactly and the little man don't have even an access point to say let, let the, to the um the uh, tourist bus come to my space come to my celebration come to my shop no if you got a big shop with big and that and camera and glass case and this and that you know which the average man can't, can't but the worst thing do. is that they they legalize it for the big man and it's I'm still saying? not legal for the small man so every little uh, every little opportunity where you could say jamaica has had for it from where the music from back again to scarrock steady to i'm um, saying ganja to coconut and bauxite and all these things banana sugar cane all these things i'm saying have served the interest of the landed and the the politically connected and the wealthy as opposed to the average Jamaica. Yeah. So like I'm saying, we have a hard road to travel. So Jamaica 60 is a stepping stone, but it's a long, long journey as to go. Because if you look at what we've done in 60 years, in terms of these aspects of our life, we have not done much to improve it. We have not done much at all. Yeah, we have not done yeah. much. Not done much at all. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Goff. Your, you know, your discussion was really, really powerful. And I hope that there's something that we can do to, to change all of this. Because... We have to keep it vocal, you know? Yeah, we have to. We have to. Yeah, we have to. We have to. We have to. So many things to change. If we can change these things, then we, we have a chance. You know, like this two-party system, the school curriculum, all these things are things that are keeping us backwards. 
way, yeah, way back. So, yeah, man. You know, so I'm saying, but one of the main areas, too, I'm saying, is, of course, with the, the, the Maroons, right? The, the Maroons have an important role to play. Oh, yes. Because the Maroons have been able to continue to maintain their communities, their traditional governance systems, right? Colonel and council and so forth for all these generations, you know? Um, and so once we can start to, to me, open up the thinking that people can understand that Maroon communities exist and have rights and not all rights and land is held by the crown, you know, you can hopefully start to think that other people then outside of, um, you know, those who have land titles also have land rights too, yes. you know, as well, because again, the only land title means they have land rights. Other people have land rights without land title. And so we're saying that, you know, hopefully with the Maroons coming together to advocate for recognition of their land rights, you'll be able to see more, um, you know, more, I think, thinking outside of the box for us to have more people have their land rights recognized and, you know, properly uh, protected by law. Yeah, and that will improve the standard of living, the, you know, people be more comfortable within themselves. Definitely. You know, Definitely. If, they, if they don't have to be worrying of renting and this and that and, oh, we are a squatter, you know, all these negative so, terms. You know, we, we so don't so. have the, the ghetto already and the squatters and, the, you know, all these things to keep you depressed. So true. And depression means stress. And we wonder why we are in so much turmoil as regards to, to crime. Exactly, you have intergenerational stress and trauma yeah. affecting so many of us. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so thank you very much, sir. Me. Yes, ma my pleasure. Yeah. My if pleasure. You want any, any final words? We well, just want to encourage you, you know, um, in the work that you're doing online. I think that we have so many Jamaicans in the diaspora who maybe don't know what's happening here, can't watch TV or radio locally, but, you know, through online of access to hear what's happening here. So I want to encourage you and the team to keep on highlighting these stories that affect the people and people's lives and people's interests and rights, you know, so keep up the good work. So. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's our aim and, you know, we're going to keep it going. Best Thanks for being with us, Mr. Goff. Um, I couldn't participate much because of the noise in my background. Okay. But um, I got a lot of information. I learned a lot. Okay. Because I was, I was, I was, I was, I was putting down my jottings. <laughs> and um, okay. I don't think we, I don't think we celebrated Jamaica 60, you know. I think we just um, started to um, celebrate Jamaica slippery, not 60. Jamaica <laughs> slippery, yeah. Yeah. Jamaica right. slippery, yeah? No, the Jamaica yeah. 60 yeah. thing was a total dis disappointment. Uh -huh. You know? Yeah. They like enough thought and enough planning was to put in it. It was just yeah. blah, you know, just. Mm. We probably have to celebrate 61 next year, you know. <laughs> or something needs to be slippery done. Slippery one, slippery one. Yeah? Yes, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. yes. Very important. <laughs> but I must commend the, the, the Maroons for keeping up the whole thing, you know, for so long and still going, you know. So Especially Charles Town, who is really putting out a lot of, a lot of work, exposing a lot of things, and that is, you know, that is so critical, very, very critical, yes. very critical. And I'm also very happy that the, the Tainos are also coming, you know, coming on also. Very, very true. Very important. Very important. So, very, uh, very critical. Yeah. Uh, big up all of our colonels. Big up Colonel Kim and Colonel Douglas and Dr. Yeah. Bedeer. Yes. Oh, and definitely. Yeah. Yes. Uh, from the windward, I'm just send shout out the same way to Kampong. Yes. You know, no matter what, you know. Oh, yes. And oh, of yes. course, to our time, our family, Kasike, Kalan, and everyone, too. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. Yeah, wonderful. For the good work. Yeah, man. Okay, so we close, but I, we will, Courtney, we'll get back to you because we have to continue this discussion. 
Okay, man. Let me know this, when. This is great, but we have a lot more to talk about, as you realize. Yes, yes, mm. yes. So until until then, thank you very much. Okay. All right, man. Take care. Have a good day. Bye. Okay. Yeah, man. You too. Bye, Miss Lee. Bye. You lead a song for love. You be love the way I was. I do a love. Never be seru. Lead a moa. Lead a song for love. Lead a moa. Lead a song for love. Well, unfortunately, this is it. Till next time. Bless. I forget what I was trying to say I no longer do what I was gonna do But you're no good for me That's why me do what set me a fickle flea Me I'm fickle for me say